The time is now for regional governments to develop and implement disruptive and forward-thinking program concepts, policies, and platforms that fast-track the development of a Caribbean technology economy. At the core of this, my friends, transformation must be the sustainable maximization of our most highly valued assets. You know them, and I know them. Our people, our ideas, our geography, our climate, yes, our climate, and our culture. Good evening and welcome to the Clip Speaker Series. My name is Crystal Legrand and I'm your moderator from the Caribbean Center of Excellence for Sustainable Livelihoods. The Caribbean Youth Livelihood Internship Program, better known as CLIP, is part of the strengthening disaster resilience in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean. The project is designed and implemented by the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology to assist recent university and other tertiary institution graduates whose job opportunities and livelihoods are under threat due to the COVID-19 pandemic and other factors. The program provides them with additional technical, entrepreneurial, and business development skills essential for enhancing their employment opportunities, whether that be through self-employment or more traditional employment. It is anticipated that some graduates of the program will become part of the Caribbean cohort of young innovators that will help drive Caribbean innovation during the post COVID-19 periods. The International Labor Organization describes the youth of Latin America and the Caribbean who's experienced the pandemic as the lockdown generation and their employment situation as a ticking time bomb. To quote ILO Regional Director Vincencias Panero, this generation has experienced the impacts of COVID-19 in many ways, such as the interruption of their educational and training programs and the bridge to their labor market through apprenticeships and internships and the loss of employment and income and the prospect of facing greater difficulties in finding an occupation in the future. Therefore, and specifically during the nine months phase of the CLIP program, the interns will spend time building their competencies and knowledge, developing scientific and technical know-how, critical thinking, and entrepreneurship skills in an experiential learning environment based on their interests, prior knowledge, and fitting in with their career goals. CLIP implementation is made possible by the generous support of the American people through the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. Tonight, the topic of our speaker series is Climate Smart Agriculture, and it is my pleasure to be joined today by two brilliant entrepreneurs in this sector, Ms. Christina Puller, and as well as Mr. Joshua Forth. Before we hear from our first speakers, I invite Dr. David Farrell, the principal of the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology to open the series with a welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. And um, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, everyone to this uh, session of CLIP. Uh, clip having been already defined. But let me start first by uh, thanking uh, all of you young people who have applied uh, to, to the CLIP internship program. It is precisely you guys that we're trying to reach and trying to work with. And as pointed out by the moderator, help you build sustainable futures and uh, a sustainable Caribbean that is climate resilient and climate smart. The first thing I'd like to do uh, as well is uh, thank USAID and the 
uh, US people for making the funds avail available to run the Strengthening Disaster and Climate Resilience in the Caribbean Program, uh, SDCR. The SDCR project was conceptualized by staff at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. It was designed really to look at disaster risk reduction and climate change and the nexus between the two and to foster a safe and secure Caribbean. During the implementation of CLIP, one of the things that, uh, sorry, of the SDCR, one of the things that happened was the pandemic. The Institute has, has had a long history of working with uh, young people in the Caribbean. We've certainly been running an internship program since about 2006. And every year we've had interns either from UWI. And last year we had interns taking part in our internship program from the United States of America as well. We've also had interns from different parts of the world, uh, Europe in particular, who've also come to the Institute to take part in our internship programs. And so our internship programs are widely recognized. Last year, uh, sorry, during the COVID period, uh, and in particular 2020 to 2021, one of the things that we recognized was that uh, a lot of young people were going to struggle with uh, finding employment. With all the displaced workers coming back into uh, to jobs, the market was going to be saturated with uh, people with experience. But one of the things that we thought would be interesting was rather than look young people looking for work, we would want it, we wanted to explore young people looking for opportunities, opportunities to do things new. And so one of the things that we came up with was the CLIP program, which focuses not just on the traditional internship program in science and technology, but really looking to leverage science and technology to support innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's where we launch CLIP, really looking at that particular focus. And so one of the things that I'm going to encourage each of you in this program to do is to try to be as innovative and as entrepreneurial as you can be in bridging the, that gap between science and innovation and science and entrepreneurship in the region. Science is a business. It's no longer a vocation. And so there are, there's plenty opportunity for young people to really start to build a business around science. And so that's what we're trying to encourage each and every one of you is to start exploring that whole idea of building a business and building your own future, designing your own future in the area of science and technology to, to support the region's adaptation to climate change, extreme weather, and increasing climate variability amongst other things. And so that's really where we want to place the focus with all of you young people in here is to be as creative and as entrepreneurial as you can be. One of the things that the CLIP program will present you with is certainly the opportunity to take courses overseas. And that's one of the things that we have highlighted here. The last, you guys sitting here represent in many ways, the second CLIP cohort. We had a cohort uh, last year. And one of the things that a lot of members of that cohort were able to do were to take courses from the Harvard Business School in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship. But on top of that, you were allowed to take other courses that you found interesting. One of the things that we're hopeful again that we'll do is to do the Harvard Business School program, but certainly strongly encourage each and every, every one of you to also uh, look for courses that you find interesting and that will help you build your entrepreneurship and innovative spirit. Uh, you may not appreciate what you gain from these courses now, but I'm certain that well into the future, as you look back at what you've learned, you will be able to apply it to build your future. And so I'd like to thank uh, the staff at CIMH for putting this uh, program together, in particular, uh, Mrs. Sidney Pascal, who's in, in the program manager for CLIP and the SDCR project, and certainly the other members of staff who helped put together the SDCR program, 
who also work with quite a number of the uh, young people in the CLIP uh, program as well. And also to this year, we have a number of external stakeholders, just like last year, who have expressed an interest in supporting the CLIP. And I want to not necessarily call out all of them, but certainly we've got MET services that are supporting the CLIP this year. We also have AICA that is also supporting the CLIP and there are a number of you in here that are work that will be working with AICA in the area of, uh, in the area of agri agriculture. So without uh, drawing this out for too long, I'd certainly look forward to the speaker series, which we're starting this time or this time this year. And I hope that uh, many of you young people will gain some insights from each speaker. And I hope that uh, coming out of that, that you may also be able to network with the speakers to gain additional insights beyond what you, you hear today. So again, uh, I just wanna thank everyone uh, of you for applying and for the speakers who will present for taking the time out of their busy schedules to participate in this important event. Again, thank you. And I look forward to listening in on the presentations uh, this evening and myself gaining some insight in the, into the world of innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Thank you so much for the warm welcome address. And we hope that all our viewers here are taking this into consideration and maximizing the opportunity here through the CLIP program. So as we get straight into our speaker series, I have the honor of introducing one of the Caribbean entrepreneurs, Miss um, Christina Poehler, Poehler, sorry. Christina Poehler is a third generation agriculturalist, is the owner of Zantaria Farms, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. So Christina, you can correct me if I'm incorrect. And she is, the farm is a one acre family owned farm located in St. Philip's Barbados. Currently the farm produces livestock, vegetables, and with an Asperry um, as the latest addition, with her background in building and civil engineering, computer science, and with the assistance from several organizations, she has created sustainable patterns of design on the farm to effectively manage her agribusiness. This includes soil and waste management, water harvesting, and solar technology. Christina was also part of the 2022 cohort of the Young Leaders of America's In Initiative, Wiley, advancing her knowledge in farm operations and management. At present, Christina is pursuing her master's in natural resource and environmental management and was recently awarded a year long fellowship with the National Oceanic and Asthma atmospheric administration to conduct an experimental study on improving soil quality for agriculture. Additionally, Christina works with several organizations such as Slow Food Barbados, Caribbean Agriculture Research and Development Institute, CARDI, Caribbean Primitive Pre Primacultural Research Institute, Barbados National Union Fishery Folk Organization. Help me welcome Christina Poehler. Welcome to our speaker series this evening. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me today. Good evening, Christina. And before I turn everything over to you with your presentation for tonight, we would love to hear from you. How long have you been an entrepreneur? Uh, I would say I have been an entrepreneur uh, for about eight years now. Yes. And how do you see your business fitting into the efforts to contribute to climate resilience in the Caribbean region? Uh, so I would say that my business is one of many here in Barbados and within a region that uh, contributes to climate resilience. As a business, we tend to prioritize uh, food sovereignty and implement climate smart strategies in order to increase our resilience to climate change. 
Absolutely. And thank you so much for your contribution to the initiatives of sustainability in the Caribbean region. And without further ado, I would love to hand it over to you so that you can share with us your presentation on your business. Okay, so I just want to say thank you for having me here again this evening. And uh, <clears throat> I am pleased to introduce myself as the Managing Director of Zanteria Farms. And my name is Christina Pooler. Currently, uh, I'm pursuing my master's in natural resource and environmental management, and also looking as well to do research into uh, soil health and looking at strategies for our local farmers to enhance their climate resilience as well. So some people usually ask, uh, why did they decide to go into agriculture? So I've always been involved in agriculture from a young age. So I would say that I've inherited the entrepreneurial street and the work ethic from my parents and extended family. Uh, so my family stretch, stretches across a range of uh, different uh, careers. So that involves livestock production, uh, fish processing, and also culinary arts. In about around 2014, I made the decision to perform pursue a career in agriculture and I've continued or committed to remaining in this path ever since then. Through attending various workshops and training sessions, I've been able to advance my business to where it is today. So at Zantria Farms, we use a number of sustainable and regenerative practices to contribute to food security within our community and across the island. And we believe by implementing these practices, we can make a positive impact on the environment, which also provides, while also providing uh, access to, to high quality locally produced foods for customers on the island. So in the realm of agriculture, technology definitely serves a crucial function for my business. Our business utilizes numerous technologies to collect data uh, and to effectively manage the farm operations, such as the production cycle and also uh, the different financial aspects that goes into running a business. Additionally, we have implemented various sustainable techniques to address risks that are commonly associated with agriculture and climate change. Uh, our approach to building resilience to climate change involves using solar technology. So in the first photo over here to the left, our uh, chicken area is entirely off-grid. We use uh, integrated pest management and uh, also soil and waste management strategies to run the entire farm to ensure that we produce no waste. And it's kind of a circular process going on with the entire farm. So I would say that it's imperative for us to make a shift from the focus on food security and move towards food sovereignty. So to ensure a balanced and equitable approach to food and agriculture, we need to respect the rights of individuals to access healthy foods, honor the cultural significance that's associated with foods and also to maintain our own autonomy in terms of defining our own food and agricultural systems. So my work also involves closely collaborating with various organizations that were mentioned before, like uh, CPRI, ECA, Slow Food, Barbados, and many more, to promote the engagement of youth in agriculture, and also to spread the awareness about the importance of clean, good, and fair food for everyone. As you consider uh, your business and career paths, is it important to also reflect on the legacy you hope to leave behind? So one way I may contribute to, I would say that I contribute to the sector's longevity and resilience is through partnerships, uh, serving as a mentor and also consulting on a range of agricultural initiatives to build the capacity of upcoming agriculturalists and also persons looking to do research in agriculture.
So for example, here uh, up to yesterday, I facilitated a workshop with, um, with uh, the International Trade Center and Cardi teaching farmers in mother palm selection for coconut and also establishing coconut nurseries on the island. So hopefully coming out of that uh, group, we will have some new farmers establishing new coconut nurseries to, to help diversify and to maintain the local coconut uh, palm stock that we have here on the island. So here are a number of organizations that I'm very grateful to that would have supported me throughout the years from inception until now. So these few first few would have assisted me as I was new in the sector, brainstorming my ideas and receiving, and I received guidance. Um, I submitted grant applications and they also assisted with um, the initial training that I would have gone through, seeing that I didn't have any formal training in agriculture. And they also gave me the opportunity to start small projects to get my footing um, in this particular sector. So with continued networking and the ability to adapt my environment and constantly looking for ways to improve my personal and business development has allotted me with other opportunities to grow through uh, research, science diplomacy, and entrepreneurial business skills. So I would definitely say going through your uh, whole business development process, that networking with different organizations and like-minded um, entrepreneurs is uh, definitely beneficial in terms of building your business and uh, building a legacy in terms of your career. This brings me to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Ms. Fuller, for your amazing presentation. And I would love to pick up right where you left off on your collaborations with several partnerships. One of the questions, uh, the initial questions that we have for you is, you know, how did you identify and foster these past, um, partnerships? I would say initially, um, I guess it was a bit com coming now into uh, building a business and everything. I was a bit timid in terms of, you know, reaching out to different partners and, and organizations that would be able to lend that type of assistance. But um, working with the initial set of organizations, they had given me the, the confidence to, you know, take that step into asking for assistance, getting additional training and what's not. So it's been a journey, but it was definitely worth it. Absolutely. And, you know, if we look back at where you started, because you had now a eight year span of developing your business and developing your entrepreneurship skills, what advice do you have for yourself or would you have given yourself in the early onset of coming into your entrepreneurship journey? Gosh, to myself. Um... I would say to myself, probably not to be afraid of change that, you know, you might have an original idea, but as you grow, things will evolve and, you know, uh, into something entirely different or your original idea might grow from there. So I would say definitely be open to change. Opening to change. Absolutely. And let's talk about, you know, in business, um, some people see trust as a currency in business. How do you view trust in your personal and business life? And what are some key factors to contributing to the sustainability of your business when it became, you know, even in talking about trusting yourself and trusting the process of change, even in the midst of change? First, I would say you definitely have to believe in yourself that, you can accomplish your goals and then also surrounding yourself um, with trustworthy people that understand your mission and goals in terms of running your business. And then also having uh, a, a person or core group of people that support your, your um, initiatives and business to, to help you or to give you that push in order to continue growing. Yeah. 
And when we think, you know, we don't want to paint a picture for our um, young adults that are going into entrepreneurship or otherwise, that everything is smooth sailing. So share with us some major setbacks or even lessons that you've learned over the course of your building of your career. Um, how did you overcome it? So what was the situation and how you overcome it? And, you know, some of the key lessons you've learned from that setback. I would say um, from start to note that uh, the my biggest hurdle was having the finances to to um, cover my my big ideas. Um, the ideas were were way bigger than the finances that I had available. But um, I used a like a kind of like an ethos from permaculture, taking small slow solutions. So taking uh, my ideas step by step uh, based on the finances that I had available. Um, look, I also uh, embarked on training to look on how to write business proposals, strategic plans, business plans in order to reach out to financial institutions and grant and grantors and to enable me to access those types of funds to, to grow my business. Absolutely. So in some ways, we have to count the costs and, and manage the process as we go through building uh, strategically, as you said, no smart. Um, yeah. Looking ahead, what do you see as the future of business and entrepreneurship, especially in this landscape, um, when it comes to climate resilience in the Caribbean? Uh, as a small island state, I think that there are a lot of areas that future businesses could look to do development in. Um, one thing is looking especially at like the circular economy because we're so small and our production can be limited at times. Uh, looking into other climate smart agriculture strategies as well that can be tailored uh, to our region. Looking at probably green construction because of limited resources as well. So like, for example, here in Barbados, we are starting to have limited resources in terms of having sand as a building material. So looking at alternatives uh, for construction and then looking at sustainable land and water management, seeing that we, uh, especially for agriculture, there's a scarcity of arable land that's available. And then, uh, in Barbados, we are one of the most water scarce uh, places in the world. Yeah. And as we round off uh, our questions, are there any final words of encouragement that you have for, you know, the entrepreneurs or the aspiring entrepreneurs that are viewing us today? Um, any words to inspire them to continue or to get into this field that you have grown to love? Uh, I would say definitely don't give up uh there's always somebody there that you can uh, ask for assistance there are numerous organizations that are willing to to provide the assistance in terms of training uh finances and what's not and make sure that it's something that you love to do Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Fuller, for thank joining you. us here on the series and kickstarting the speaker series. And we look forward to seeing so much more from you as you continue to develop your business and continue to build sustainability into our Caribbean region. So thank you so much for your service. Thank you very much. It's been Have a pleasure. Good evening. And we are not done with our series today. We have another amazing entrepreneur with us this evening. And before I introduce him, I would love to also remind you to continue to remember that we are here to inspire you to take the leap and taking the opportunity to find an innovative idea, or maybe you already have an innovative idea in mind. And so as you listen to the inspiring stories of our entrepreneurs, we're hopeful that you are digging into the treasure chest of your imagination. 
imagination and finding solutions already for the problems that you are identifying in your community. And so I know that Mr. Fort is ready to go. And so without further ado, I introduce to you Mr. Joshua Fort. He is the CEO of Red Diamond Compost. And it, he is, Red Diamond Compost is an award-winning biotech social enterprise that creates the world's cleanest green agrochemical solution from organic waste residuals and invasive Yes, invasive plants such as sargasm seaweed. He is the most recent recipient of the Barbados National Youth Award 2023 Canewood Award for his work in agriculture and continues to expand his expertise to include additional areas of environmental management with a focus on removing pollutants from the environment and improving climate resilience and and food and nutrition security. As an advocate of re regenerative organic agriculture, his work and organizations in various capacities across the region has awarded him recognitions as an expert in the field of climate smart environmental management. And without further ado, Mr. Joshua, welcome to our speaker series, to the CLIP speaker series this evening. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be Thank here. You. And so before you hop straight into your presentation, we would also like to hear from you. How long have you been in business um, and have been an entrepreneur? So in fact, maybe entrepreneur before business, but tell us yeah. about yourself. Yeah, um, as an entrepreneur would be roughly around 12 years. Um, in business with Red Diamond specifically, we're going to be coming up on nine years now. Amazing. And how do you see your role and business fitting into the efforts to address climate goals in the Caribbean region? Well, I say we fit into the, the mix uh, quite perfectly. Uh, what we do, the actions that we take and our mission and objectives allows us to cross-set many different areas of um, sustainable um, land management, looking at food and nutrition security, and organic solid waste management all at the same time. Amazing. So we look forward to seeing a hearty presentation from you about your business, and then we'll be back with some questions. So over to you. So as mentioned, um, Red Diamond Compost is a biotech social enterprise where we focus on creating clean and green agrochemical solutions. And these are solutions such as fertilizers, biostimulants, um, and other soil amendments, all with the goal of ensuring that persons can grow food, produce healthy food in an environment free of toxic synthetic chemicals. Now, I'm going to be sharing a bit of the origin story around Red Diamond, how I started, and a bit about where we are today. Now, as you can see on this particular slide at the bottom, we have a whole set of organizations that I would have worked with over the years. And, um, you know, honestly, the amazing journey that um, we've been on would not have been possible without each and every one of these organizations. And, you know, going through them, they tell us a story um, of their own pretty much. But as mentioned, our focus is, is all around building soil infusing new life and vitality into soil. And if you had asked me, say, 10 years ago, if you know this is what I thought I would be doing, it would probably be the furthest thing from my mind. But due to a series of unexpected events and experiences, you know, it brought me to this place of starting Red Diamond Compost. Now, some of the highlights of the journey thus far, just going back to, to 2019, there are a few others before, um, I was able to participate in the Global Entrepreneurship Summit as a delegate. I was the winner of the Climate Launch Pad Barbados Nationals and went on to the Global Grand Finals in Netherlands. Um, was a winner of the 2020 Tika Americas Caribbean Innovation Competition. And that's after having applied um, three times before. So that was the fourth time that I actually applied to that competition. Um, I was a winner of the Commonwealth Innovation Award in 2021. And as mentioned, the Kingwood Award that we received um, this year as well. So 
these different stages throughout the journey were um, some very key milestones and huge learning experiences that I, I, I went through as I was developing Red Diamond, as I was coming from that initial idea of conception and evolving and reiterating it and refining it each and every time to take it to the next level. One of the things about me is that I always had a huge vision to, for what I wanted Red Diamond to be, what I envisioned it to be, but getting it broken down into those small incremental steps to move from that A to Z was one of the biggest challenges that I faced. And this um, series of, of events and journeys that we went on allowed me to get to where we are today. Now, going back to 2014, I was in a place where I had undergone a health crisis. I, came, I became seriously ill a few years earlier, and I was battling with that, you know, had gone to the doctor, was put on medication, and was, you know, operating at a pretty okay level, but still not my best self. And you might be looking at the various images and wondering why, if, if that is an iguana on my shoulder, and yes, it is. That's my pet iguana, Apollo. And how she's integral to the story is, I was looking for ways to feed my iguana without having to keep going to the supermarket to buy these leafy green vegetables, which I myself personally was not a huge fan of. So after becoming ill and everything, I was taking care of Apollo and I was deciding, you know, I need to grow this food. It's too expensive to purchase. Let me see how I can do that. And this is where I came across a guy online talking about nutrient dense foods and, you know, how he changed his life and the impact that our agricultural system, the conventional agricultural system had on the nutritional levels of our food. So after listening to it long enough and, you know, looking into actually growing some of the, these different um, nutrient dense foods, these leafy green vegetables, I decided I was going to take a, a change and see if there was any merit, you know, truly to what was being said. And it was at that point, I had this, this experience after making some, some initial changes, I had this, this epiphany more or less, this life changing experience and I needed to learn more about it because I had felt some energy in my body that I had never um, experienced before. So I started to go down a, a path looking at food and nutrition, really understanding you know, how our food is assimilated, how it benefits the body, and then wanting to go even deeper to back to that source of how to grow this food and understanding the differences in the nutritional levels of food, depending on how it's grown, I sought out those inputs that I would need to create this nutrient rich, you know, nutrient dense soil to produce nutrient rich food. And I could not find the quality of inputs and, um, and products. I couldn't find them locally and I couldn't find them regionally. And at this same very time, while I was dealing with my own health issues, you know, we were seeing reports in the media, not only for Barbados, but across the Caribbean about the, the health crisis, you know, the rising um, NCD um, rates, especially among young people, you know, dealing with type 2 diabetes and these different types of um, health issues that we still hear in these reports today, even when it talks about hypertension. So I realized that this, you know, the issue I was trying to solve for myself was a lot bigger. It was, there were more people affected and I, I was sure that there may be many other people who are looking for solutions as well. So this is where I decided I would um, actually start a company towards developing these solutions. Now, prior to that, why I decided to also get into the agriculture space is because coming right out of school, I did do a job attachment at our Ministry of Agriculture here. Um, I was working in a planning unit, you know, working with the statistician, and I was able to get some insight into the industry, be able to attend stakehold, um, stakeholder meetings, going out into the field and actually meeting with farmers and collecting data. And, you know, I saw a lot of opportunity in the space um, that, you know, was there, um, you know, to, to, to go after. So with that being kind of the, the initial, um, you know, pull into the space, and then those series of events affecting my health, culminating into this point where I decided, you know, I'm going to take a leap in this direction. But having that information and expertise was a key thing that I was seeking out. And 
as I was, you know, continuing to learn, you know, just searching online and, and learning as much as I can, I came across this gentleman who had a composting facility, the soil scientist out of Texas. And, you know, what he was talking about was inspiring to me. It was motivating um, because composting facilities, you know, compost being like the, the creme de la creme when you're talking about soil health. And, you know, what he was talking about was a bit different from all the other facilities that were, were popping up. He was talking a lot about the soil science, about the microorganisms in the soil and the quality of what he was producing, you know, was drastically, was drastically different. So I said, you know what, this, the, the information that this guy has is, is exactly what I need. You know, I need to get in touch with this guy. And I literally spent um, probably a, a day and a half searching for direct contact for this gentleman out in Texas, you know, me here in Sydney and Barbados, to see if he would be willing to, to teach me, to mentor me, you know, whatever. You know, I just had to reach out to him to see if he would be willing to. And to my surprise, the same evening that I emailed him, he got right back to me and, you know, told me he would be willing to help me in any way he could. And I was completely floored. I really could not believe it. This, um, you know, in my head is like this, this uh, 65 year old gentleman out in Texas, I have no idea who I am and he's willing to help. And that was, you know, the mentorship and guidance I got from him built the foundation for how I built out Red Diamond Compost. Now, going through a series of, you know, trial and error in terms of how to set up the business, you know, looking for funding for this huge idea and not being able to get it, not being able to find those resources. Um, we had the occurrence of the sargassum seaweed influx into the region um, really coming in heavy 2014, 2015. And for me, the plan that I had for Red Diamond, um, ha having full awareness of the agriculture, space in terms of the, the sustainable crop inputs. Seaweed products is something that we had as like this future future thing that we would look at doing a seaweed extract. But when all this sargassum seaweed washed up, I decided, you know what, this is just washing up on the beach, freely available. I don't have the resources to do the composting, but at scale, I was able to do you know small um, level composting, but not at an economical scale where it would be you know financially viable. So let me see what we can do with the sargassum and if we can build something from it. And this is where I started experimenting with the sargassum CV that was washing up. Now, this would start off with me, you know, searching for research papers, scouring the internet, finding any traces of information about sargassum, about different species of sargassum and any work that had been done at the time, to, you know, be able to give myself a foundation to, to build upon. But with the first extracts that I started making, literally with my, my grandmother's old pot in my mom's kitchen, um, you know, we started to, to, to do these different um, extracts and concoctions and tested it on the easiest thing I had available, which were these peanut seedlings, um, just, just raw peanuts, and started germinating them, which I've done time and time before. But we just saw some amazing, or freakish growth more or less, uh, from the, the root development of those, those peanuts. and. You know, that was like the first indicator that we were on to something. With that, again, just continual trial and error, anecdotal trials in the yard with the plants, testing it, seeing the results, monitoring it, and continuing to, to develop it, and then getting to a place where we could um, have other people try it, you know, going out to my friends, connecting with them, and seeing who would be interested in using it. But obviously, wanting to be able to scale the business up and actually have some level of foundation um, to build on towards gaining financing from investors um, or even grant funding, I decided to reach out to a university professor, Professor Lopez here at UEK Hill campus. And, you know, I reached out to him, let him know what I was working on to see if he would be able to, you know, assist me with doing some trials, which you know, thankfully he was interested and had a student who, who was interested in trying the product. And we were able to see some preliminary results with a sweet pepper trial, just looking at the overall productivity. And we saw that the biostimulant was effective at improving the plant growth, you know, compared to conventional treatments. You know, all at this stage, I was able to go out and harvest the sargassum, very manual grueling process. You know, nothing, nothing luxurious, nothing pretty at all. But one of the things I always make sure, you know, where I mentioned 
being in business before getting into Red Diamond, a lot of what I was doing was on the computer dealing and graphic designing. And I used those skills to design our labels, design our websites when we were initially setting up and making sure that how we presented Red Diamond and that, that image and of what we wanted Red Diamond to represent in terms of the quality of the products was always at the highest level possible. Fast forward in a few years later now, we've redesigned and reformulated the um, super C B biostimulant, which it was originally called as the Supreme C biostimulant, brand new formulation. And thanks to the support from the Bloom Clean Tech cluster and Export Barbados, we were able to get some very sophisticated um, testing and analysis done and crop trials as well to help um, validate the efficacy um, of the Supreme C biostimulant, but as well as our secondary product, um, second flagship product, the liquid sunshine organic fertilizer which is made from a completely different um, plant material than the sargassum. But, you know, this was a testament to me at the time, you know, while I was working on that biostimulant, that was not the sole thing I was doing. I was always, because there were so many different challenges and obstacles, you were always tinkering to see and identify what was truly the, the lowest hanging fruit. And during this period, I was doing different things from working with different organizations um, as much in the, in the climate space. I got to a level where I was able to actually um, start teaching programs on um, soil and soil health. And you know, from there, we were able to build a foundation and continue to build on it as we develop red diamond compost into something bigger and greater. So with those two flagship products, we still decided that it's important to get back to that core product, which was the compost that we started off with, and even looking at branching off into other products such as the animal feed and feed supplements. And there, there's some even greater things that we're also working on um, that you know we'll be, be announcing in the near future. But each and every step along the way, it was a, a process of learning and, and development and um, seeking ways to use each and every uh, in, interaction and process to help move the needle a step forward towards gaining financing towards having a very solid um, you know market validation in terms of how our products and our brands and testing that against the fire more or less so that we know that when we're moving forward for the next 10 20 years we have a very solid foundation and truly know the ins and outs of our business um going back to the key purpose uh one of the key purposes and, and key focal areas for us being climate resilience and looking at the impact that we see our products having on the environment for both not only for barbados but the caribbean at large and, and even outside uh, at the international scale we look at the potential for our products to reduce you know the greenhouse gas emissions and we are essentially developing an entire system, not just looking at these individual products, but from the product production, the product um, creation and, and application. And that entire cycle, being able to monitor and collect the data at all of those points, so we can actually truly determine what level of impact we're having or how great the level of impact is when we're looking at the fight against climate change and truly becoming climate resilient, building out this system that we could move into the future with so that as we are working towards our mission and our goals, we are actually able to account for it, measure it, and actually deliver that and report that value you know, to the public. So again, our goal and mission is to ensure that we are able to bring you know, new life and vitality to soils around the world, to, to nutrition to, to persons around the world, and you know, transforming the agrochemical industry into a circular economy is the, the ultimate goal for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ford. And um, we wanna actually just dive straight into a few questions before we open up the floor to our audience to ask a few questions of their own. So if you have a question, you can start typing your questions into the chat. But in the meantime, 
Uh, Mr. Ford, in your experience in building a business with science and technical knowledge at its base, which is most important, fully understanding the science at the very start or learning as you go, but having solid business knowledge and tools such as business plans, um, adequate finance, and those types of things um, under your belt before getting in? Which one is the priority? Well, that's a really tough question. Uh <laughs> Well, a really good one indeed. Thank you for that. Uh, I would say it is, it is really looking at what resources you have and figuring out where your strengths are. That, that's, that's what the key thing is. So figuring out what your strengths are, is, is your strength, you know, being able to have that technical knowledge and really understanding the depths of the science? Is it on the business end, understanding the market and the financing and that process? Um, you know, it, it, it is understanding where your strengths are and then finding those key people, those key team members or partners who can help you fill those gaps. For me, I was always kind of that, you know, jack of all trades type of, type of person. So um, for getting the understanding fully of the, the, the science and the industry, the business side, which, you know, business was, was always a passion of mine, was really, really important. So I literally spent like the first initial month building out this detailed business plan for Red Diamond, you know, to send to a huge international finance corporation, which, which, you know, looking back was, was quite ambitious type, you know, type of, type of move. But I was so glad that I was that ambitious and that hungry for it because I learned so much in developing that so much about the industry. Um, but yeah, getting those key people who are able, those key persons who are able to help fill in those gaps is, is the way to go. Absolutely. So play to your strengths then. Yeah. Absolutely. So what specific um, practices or initiatives um, have you implemented to ensure sustainability and minimize environmental footprint within your own business? Yeah, so this is something that's really, really important to us. Um, how we, we measure the impact of every single um, aspect of what we do. Is, is, is critical and we want to make sure that we are always improving the, the current situation and not you know um, making it worse and which could you know tend to be challenging for persons when you're thinking about the business aspect and there's always that conversation around you know um, the mission or the social aspect versus the profits and I made it a principle for us at Red Diamond the priority is the, the environmental and social mission that is the priority and it's figuring out how we are able to achieve that profitably. And that's, that's the way, that's one of the key cornerstones of what we do. So from the way we go about developing our products, um, from the way we create, you know, zero waste processes, essentially. So uh, for example, with the, the Supremacy Biostimulant, that's a zero waste process where the byproducts from creating the extract go into an age composting process and that's another valuable end product. These are the type of principles that we, we use. Absolutely. And as an entrepreneur, um, how do you stay ahead of the curve? Because there's so many new innovations coming into this space as this is now becoming such an important factor in our you know, development and sustainability. So how do you stay above the curve? And what advice maybe do you have for our young entrepreneurs in staying innovative in your business? I would say it's really having, you need to have a level of foresight towards the direction uh, of where the industry is going. And, you know, you're able to find a lot of information around that. There's some early indicators, especially, you know, say operating from the Caribbean, you could see trends that may be happening in, in Europe, in the US, in Asia even. And you could kind of see where the, the general consensus, the direction is going in. Um, connecting with all these different networks and partners, you know, you would see us as um, we're actually signed on as members of the four per 1000 initiative coming out of France, we're signed on to regeneration international partners. So we are in the loop of the information as is, as is coming out. So anything that's relevant to us in the direction that we are going our mission and, and, and our vision, we're always plugged into what plugged into that. We're not necessarily acting on it immediately because in our current environment, it may not be um, immediately relevant, but we're always aware of it. And it's just being able to soak in um, and absorb as much of that information that's, that's you know, moving around in the ethos as possible. 
Absolutely. And as one who has, you know, worked with several partners, even taking the leap of faith to reach out to someone completely outside of the Caribbean region, how much um, does trust play a role in, you know, um, taking the leap to take those um, steps to reach out to persons, how much information you trust them with and so on? Um, how does trust play a role in the development of your business and how you operate? Well, for me personally, it's a, a, an interesting question because I am honestly not the type of person that's too trusting of people. And there's, you know, it's, it's like a sense of, of um, having that, that cautious uh, mentality about how you're moving and um, more or less safeguarding yourself but still at the same time being courageous enough to go out there. So knowing how much to, to, to put out, but knowing how much to keep back in reserve, more or less. I would say trust for me is not the biggest thing, it's more integrity. I, I see in integrity, although you know there's a fact of trust obviously included there, but um, having a situation where you have people that you engage with, you engage with many different people, and it's whether or not what that person says to you, their actions match that. And, and that's more where the focus is for me in, in how I do business and how I, I deal with relationships. You know, I try to make sure that, you know, my actions, um, my, my, my actions and my words are congruent. You know, they go hand in hand, they're together and, and they match. And I, that's, that's what I look for in, in other persons when it comes to business, um, you know, business personal on any level is, is the integrity aspect for me, um, you know, more than anything else. Absolutely. And you mentioned before that, you know, you've been monitoring, you know, the incoming trends and things like that. Are there any innovative ideas that you've seen up and coming or you think that person should explore more that you may not be exploring because you've already kind of honed in on what you're working on? But are there any other ideas that you think persons should keep their eyes on um, through, you know, for the young people that are listening and viewing this uh, clip speaker series? Um, definitely, there's, there's, there's always um, new and exciting stuff happening. Uh, definitely, I think in the areas of um, AI, which you know is one of the hottest things right now. I think looking at ways that these 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 different technologies can be applied to help improve um, outdated systems and outdated ways of doing things is is an area that more people need to look into. And it could be hard initially to figure out the connection between the two, but it's just having the right questions in mind as even if it's possible, you know. Can, can this technology in particular benefit anything at all? Or where are some of the pitfalls, say, you know, where we're looking at um, agriculture and, you know, from my perspective of the biotechnology side of agriculture, seeing, you know, what, what else could be done? There's a lot to be done when you're looking at um, artificial intelligence, biotechnology. Data is one of the biggest things that I always tell people, especially in the Caribbean, to, to look at, when you're looking at starting a business, when you're looking at investing, um, data is one of those big gaps that exists, unfortunately. And I think if we are able to get more entrepreneurs working working in the space of, of, of um, understanding how to effectively collect that data, but harnessing value from it, you know, it, it makes a big difference, especially as a business owner. There's a lot of times that you want some very key information and no one has it. Is you like you might you, you have the money to buy it even if it's available, but no one has it. And that's a big problem. So those are some of the key areas I would recommend. Yes. And in rounding off our speaker series for tonight, are there any final words that you have for our young people listening and viewing? Um and we might have someone with a question, but in the meantime, any final words um, that you might um, like to leave with the young people that are aspiring to get into this space? Sure, I, I would say having a, a, an open mind about you know, what you're interested in um, or what you think you might be interested in because you never know what series of events might unfold that you know, you know, put you in a direction that you, you never expected. But, um always having the perspective of 
adding value to person's lives. Seeing how you, you know, not just looking at the problem solving, but that whatever solution it look, whatever solution it is that you choose to pursue is going to add value to someone's life. Realistically, you know, whether we're talking about climate change, agriculture, food and nutrition, people care about, you know, what you're doing when it benefits them, what benefits are they going to derive from what you're doing. So going into it, going into business, the key thing you like that you want is paying customers and what they care about is what benefits you can bring to them. So that's what I said to always keep in mind. Yes, and we have one final question then from our audience. Is there anything we can do in our education systems that other er or other areas uh, of our society to create more Christina's and more Joshua's um, in our countries? Um, that is a, a really good question. <laughs> um, thanks for that. I think having more exposure to the real world, having, having the education system um, expose students to that real world experience and real world environment a lot more would help open up um, you know, the minds of, of, of students, of children at, at all ages. It's something, you know, you, you know when you would have that experience to go on those um, um, job fairs and stuff like that in school, but having it more ingrained as part of the curriculum Having that experience, I, I interesting, in, interestingly enough, I'm the type of person who I was actually trying to work and get a job from a very, very young age where, you know, you would say it's illegal in the country, but, you know, and I, you know, I had to wait a certain age, but yeah, it, it, you have to kind of get rid of that invisible wall that exists between the, the school and the academic system and the actual real world practice and implementation. I think that would make a huge difference. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Fort. And thank you as well to Ms. Pooler for being the first two speakers joining us here at the CLIP speaker series. We thank you so much for your endeavors and we wish you all the best as you continue to grow and scale your businesses. We hope that everyone listening and those who will watch the replay in the future will grasp the you know the heart and the soul behind you know the resilience that is necessary to be an entrepreneur and as Christina, Christina said before Miss Pooler said before I'm sorry um, you should be able to stick with it just keep focus and continue the process I like to remind everyone that um, what we said in the beginning. So as we culminate this speaker series, we encourage you to consider what aspects of climate resilient efforts in the Caribbean you are most excited about exploring. If you're an entrepreneur or a desire to be one, or even if you have not thought about entrepreneurship before um, within the climate concept, we hope that this speaker series allows you the opportunity to um, ponder and think about getting into this field and exposing you to the excellent opportunity for you to explore options and learn more about business ideas in this space and the gaps and potential solutions which can be commercialized. We trust that today's presentation and on the topic of climate smart agriculture um, were thought provoking and inspires you to take action. Remember, just as a seed, um, requires nurturing to grow, so does our planet. So as we slow, uh, sow our innovative ideas and cultivate sustainable practices, we can harvest a future where our actions today bear the future, bring the fruit for our generations to come. So let's continue to till our soils of knowledge and innovation and plant seeds of change so that we can reap the results reap the rewards of a greener and more resilient tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, my name is Crystal Legrand and I am from the um, COESL. Thank you and we're signing out today and we hope that you join us for our next speaker series in the future. Thank you. Thank you.